Well, this is a very special treat. We have a, another amazing doctor joining us today. She's a cardiologist out of Fort Worth, Texas. As a matter of fact, she's a former New Yorker, which I found out when we first uh, introduced uh, each other. Dr. Fami Farah, thanks for joining me tonight. Well, thank you so much for having me, Alex. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Now, you are originally a Bronx gal, so tell us how this cardiologist from the Bronx ends up in Texas. That's an interesting... <laughs> That's correct. I actually grew up in Bronx, uh, New York. Um, I actually went to PS95 um, school for elementary and middle school. So my uh, parents, you know, they migrated from Bangladesh uh, when I was very little, and uh, my dad was actually a student. He was um, going to pharmacy school at the time in New York. Um, and uh, so that's how we were in New York. And, um, you know, we lived there for uh, many years. And then as I was finishing up middle school, so I actually completed eighth grade in New York. That's when my parents decided that they wanted to move away from New York, the cold weather, it was a decision made by my parents. So they came to Texas because they believed they had some family friends and uh, some other contacts in Texas. They liked it once they visited. Cool. So we moved to Fort Worth and I've been in Fort Worth since. Um, the funny thing is like, that was a pretty critical age for me. You know, I was in the eighth grade. I was throwing as much tantrums as I could possibly throw. So yeah, I was not for the move, but now here I am, Texan. <laughs> well, so your dad was, you say he was a, um, a pharmacist and whatnot growing up. Did that whole thing get you into medicine? Is that how you ended up in, in the medical field? Or what, what drove you to become a cardiologist? Actually, the reason I went into medicine is because of my family background. It's because I have a lot of family members who underwent cardiovascular disease. I had to uh, who had cardiovascular disease and underwent like surgeries and things like that, lots of hospitalizations. So I kind of grew up seeing that as a kid, we lost a lot of um, family members to heart disease uh, at young age, uh, primarily males of the family. So I kind of grew up seeing that. And, you know, as a little kid, every time I went to the hospital and I saw the amount of hope a doctor was able to bring in a vulnerable mm -hmm. moment like that, is what really um, encouraged me to want to take that route. And now you are a cardiologist. Tell me how frustrating it must have been when people were told, "Don't, don't take a look at your heart because of COVID. Don't, don't call anybody." It felt like we got that messaging, didn't we? That if you had heart attacks or anything else, don't even bother because you might get COVID. I, I don't know. That's how I kind of saw the coverage. Yeah, initially, you know, this pandemic we went through. Lots of waves, you know, um, at the beginning, um, you know, New York was uh, the epicenter really. Mm -hmm. And we saw what you guys went through. Um, at the beginning, people were really afraid to go out in general. Definitely, they were mm -hmm. afraid to go to the hospitals. Uh, we were across the nation, really. Uh, mm -hmm. We were at capacity at hospitals dealing with just COVID patients. So initially we really didn't even have enough room to see patients other than COVID, uh, we were having to bring in, you know, like we're scrambling for supplies. We didn't have enough PPEs to even see the COVID mm -hmm. patients. So yes, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a sense of discouragement from patients going to the hospital uh, for other reasons. If they could avoid mm -hmm. it, they were asked to avoid it. But that yeah. backfired because um, as we got a better handle of the uh, pandemic, not so much the virus itself, but at least how to handle the PPEs to get more supplies, to create more hospital beds, uh, we realized that patients and people in general became so afraid that they were not coming into the hospital right. for other reasons, period. And that's when we ran into problems with, you know, people having heart attack and dying from causes other than COVID. And that was not good. So now, you know, we've been trying really mm -hmm. hard as a medical community to push that message out that, you know, you absolutely need to go to the hospital, especially for serious conditions like heart attack and stroke. Well, and a lot of hospitals, especially in Texas, are reopened. And I think it's important people know that if they don't already. Um, we are a few months into this. I know we're getting a second wave here in New York again. Spikes are happening. But do you still find that there's still a messaging of don't go to the hospital? Or has 
there been a different message now saying, yes, you have to take care of yourself? Like what, what are you seeing in Texas as far as other healthcare besides COVID concerns? You there, Fima or Fami? You there? Um, no, I think the message now, at least from the medical community, has been pretty consistent. We've tried; we've all been trying um, equally to get the message out that you need to come to the hospital for non-COVID related uh, stuff as well. Um, it, it is difficult to convince people uh, because you know the fear factor is there and people know that we still don't have a cure, still the vaccine is right. not out. Uh, so the fear is definitely what's driving the whole avoidance of going to healthcare facilities, but not right. in the medical community as a whole, we are all working very hard to get that message out to come to the hospitals. And that's important. You know, I was just thinking about Texas, how some of your towns down there really went to extremes. I mean, you'd think a very red state, so to speak, would not be giving out fines and would think about personal liberty. But some of your towns did take this very serious, didn't they, early on? They did. Um, uh, they did. And, you know, you're right. Texas is a rather, mm -hmm. it, it's, the culture here is very different from New York. Um, we got... Um, a lot of patients gave us very, very difficult time at the beginning when it came to wearing masks. Um, it was very difficult to deal with that uh, until the state mandated masks. Um, you know, right. it was mandated in healthcare facilities at first by the individual healthcare facilities, but it, it was very difficult to implement that. You know, I'm a C, C, I'm the CEO of Bentley Heart Medical Center. Sure. So coming from that standpoint, I can tell you how difficult it was to implement. Uh, people were just not listening, but we're really grateful to um, the state and the governor for finally mandating it because that made it better. Well, personal liberty is, is really a big discussion around COVID and I would say healthcare too. So what happens if someone still says, I'm not going to take care of this or I'm not going to do this, that or the other? It's like, do we have to risk losing a little personal liberty to stay safe at this time? That is a very important question. Uh, you know, what I will tell you, and this is coming strictly from a medical standpoint, COVID right. has nothing to do with personal liberty. It is a disease. It is a virus that doesn't care about personal liberty. It doesn't care about who you are or what your belief system is. It'll infect you. It's looking to infect you. The way the virus survives is by jumping from host to host to host, and right. it'll find every opportunity to do so. So personal li liberty, you know, I'm a believer of personal liberty. We are all, sure. you know, we all believe in freedom. We all love America. We're all American citizens. We all have pretty much the same ideals, but we have to understand the importance here that this is a virus that's waiting to infect you. It has nothing whatsoever to do with personal liberty. So I think we need to see these two things as two separate things as they are. All right, well, I gotta ask, cause this is the big story of the week. A week ago tonight, Trump, you know, President Trump says, you know, you see Biden with the big mask and he's wearing this. Three days later, he gets the virus. But my first question isn't so much about Trump. It's the fact that Biden's tested negative. So they say this thing can be transmitted in the air if you're not six feet apart. They didn't look six feet apart at the debate. So how is it that if Trump had it maybe at the debate, Biden didn't get it if, if, you know, they're not wearing masks, they're talking to each other almost in their face. How was it Biden didn't get that? I'm kind of curious. Yeah, um, you know, it's not to say that 100% of the people will get infected. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not 100% transmission rate, um, but uh, it is high prevalence. You know, the risk of transmission is very high. I'm glad that uh, Vice President Joe Biden has not contracted it yet. Uh, I, I believe it's still kind of early actually because the transmission can happen, um, you know, for the first two weeks, that's the quarantine mm -hmm. period. So I think, I hope that, uh, um, you know, Joe Biden does not contract it, um, sure. but I think it's still early to tell. The transmission period has not ended yet for him. And I would say the same for President Trump. You know, he's only out of the hospital three days. Isn't it true some people have to stay in there the full two weeks or even a week? I mean, I think now is the big test. Everybody was like the 48 hours, this, the 48 hours. But now that he's home back at the White House, that's the big test, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, that is the big test. Um, so by getting out of the hospital, it means that he's out of the critical um, nature of the, of the virus. You know, they made sure that his lungs are not 
you know, compromised that he's able to breathe. Okay. He's not requiring oxygen supplement anymore. Uh, but you are absolutely right about prevention. So even though he's out of the hospital, he's still infectious. He's still considered infectious. So he can still potentially spread to others. So even though he's home, which is the white house, right. he still needs to quarantine himself for the sake of others. Uh, so I think that that period, the, the quarantine period that we've defined, uh, he, he absolutely needs to maintain that that would be the medical advice. But what about him personally? Does getting out of the hospital early keep him at risk still? I would think it does. It does, yes. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, it does. Um, hopefully he's still under close observation. I'm sure he is by his physicians. Um, but yeah, uh, typically, especially because you know, he does fall under the high risk category because of his age, uh, mm -hmm. the fact that he's overweight, uh, all of those kind of go against him. Um, you know, we received little information about yeah. how really he did, um, the, the really important details that other medical professionals would need to assess the situation were not entirely available. What we did know is that he had fever. Uh, what we did know is that his oxygen saturation did drop. And the other information we had is the medications he, he was treated with. All three of those um, kind of point towards a more sick uh, patient because um, some of the medications he has received like remdesivir and uh, steroid sure. usually are not given to patients who are, it's not given to every infected, COVID infected patients who are in the hospital. Oh. Those medications are reserved for very ill patients who are hospitalized. Well, and I was going to say, I don't think Thursday was the only time he had it. You know, they say he got, but obviously if you test positive, you might've had it for a longer period of time than we know, right? I, that's always my impression of this. Th that is correct. Uh, he may have had it for a little bit longer than the time when he became symptomatic. And that's, um, that's dangerous because even if he didn't know it, it, it was there and, and who knows how the testing goes. I know a lot of negatives might actually be positive, but it's just- positive. Yes, that is correct. It's, it's yes, uh, that was actually, that has been in the discussion, uh, the question of for how long he's actually been test, uh, positive. And, uh, and, you know, he did travel. Um, how many people are potentially mm -hmm. uh, at risk? Well, and you're a doctor and you're a cardiologist, but you would know body language. Seeing him, doesn't he still seem a little bit struggling to breathe? Like I've been noticing that even when he was at the White House last night. Yes, his breathing does appear to be a little bit more labored. It is hard to assess though, just by watching uh, through television. Um, you know, so I, I hope that he's under good observation by his physicians, which I'm sure he is. Maybe you can weigh in on this because I was actually utterly disgusted when people on the radical side of the left was very like, he should go now, this should be it, they should take him, it should take him. But the doctor, you know, the, the, the medical community, did they find, did you find many people were sympathetic to him or were like, this guy had it coming? What, what was the medical community around you, especially uh, reacting to this? Well, it was both actually. So a part of it was that it was not a surprise. He got the infection right. because, um, you know, we saw him at many public events uh, where he was not uh, necessarily wearing a mask. Um, so it was not entirely a surprise that he contracted the virus. Um, but, you know, for the most part, everybody's sentiment was for, you know, wishing him well. Uh, yeah. You know, people wanted him to recover well and uh, be safe. You know, like uh, part of the reason there's so much debate as to whether he should have been discharged when he was, was in fear of his health. Uh, would he be okay? And obviously it's a national security risk. I'm not going to ask about that because you're, you're in the uh, health realm, but it is a national security right. risk. Our president is not well. But maybe you could weigh in on the fact that the vaccine could also be hijacked because I know other countries are trying to take up from us what we're developing. I mean, do you know anything about that or can you weigh in on that? That's a dangerous thing if they're trying to intercept some of our trials here. Right. Um, I'm not so sure that it will be hijacked uh, in the medical community. That's, uh, you know, we are, honestly, our concern more is related to how, uh, you know, the efficacy of the virus uh, when it, mm -hmm the main concern is when it'll be coming out and when it'll be available to healthcare providers and the essential workers. Mm -hmm. But then the bigger concern is when will it be available to everybody? Like uh, that's a bigger concern, you know? Um, and the other uh, question we also have is how effective the virus will be for the population at large, because 
you know, typically uh, to develop a virus under mm -hmm. normal circumstances, it takes up to two years or longer. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how much trial and time it requires. Uh, and this vaccine is coming out, uh, we're talking about in a few months. Uh, so that's why the majority of the talk that we have in the med medical community are uh, surrounding these topics, you know. Uh, Dr. Fami Faraj, who we're talking about, she's a board certified uh, cardiologist. She's a CEO of Bentley Heart. Uh, down in Bentley Heart, I want to ask you about the, the bed size and, and the ICU space now with the second wave possibly here and in almost everywhere it feels like. But before I get to that, coronavirus, obviously Trump has some heart issues too. There's, there's some talk about that. But in general, how, how affected can the heart get if you get COVID and you might have had pre-existing health, uh, heart conditions? Um. So COVID is affecting the heart uh, for both people who have pre-existing heart condition uh, and also for people who have no pre-existing heart condition, even young people like athletes. I think you've heard it was um, quite a news um, just a week ago that lots of athletes who are young, high functioning individuals are getting affected, uh, their hearts mm -hmm. are getting affected from COVID. So uh, those patients who are you know, of um, advanced age, typically above 60s, uh, or those patients who have pre-existing heart disease, uh, mm. or those who have risk factors for heart disease like high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, smokers, all of these patients are at increased risk of having heart damage or uh, complications related to heart uh, as a result of COVID infection. Some of the heart conditions that we're seeing in really sick patients in the hospital and the ICU uh, includes heart failure. Uh, where in a heart is a pump, it's just not uh, pumping blood efficiently, and it goes into heart failure. Mm. Uh, one of the other things we're seeing is inflammation of the heart muscle itself. Uh, it's the other name for it, the medical name for it is called myocarditis. It's, um, we're seeing that quite often actually in both young and older individuals, and that's leading to arrhythmia. Arrhythmia is basically irregular heart rhythm where the heart can just go in erratic rhythm, especially if it comes from the bottom part of the heart, which is known as ventricular arrhythmia, it can cause cardiac arrest. We're seeing that in the hospital and we're also seeing that in young individuals. And that's part of the reason why some of the athletes are getting into trouble and we're seeing death as a result of this. One of the other things it's also causing is pericardial effusion, where um, that's a terminology for when fluid builds up around the heart muscle uh, outside of the heart, and it can cause serious hemodynamic compromise for patients and can also cause death. So some serious conditions, uh, heart conditions, as a result of uh, COVID-19 we're seeing in both young and older individuals. I want to talk about the athletes too. I know you had written and, and talked about that as well. I mean, the big 10 is going to come back later this month. Um, but I felt like the angle you took on that was it was a risk to bring back sports. No. Or, or what was your take on that? There certainly is um, because we have, uh, you know, heard in the news and we're seeing lots of athletes getting affected, not just the professional, you know, uh, like um, athletes. Like the Newton, big 10, yes. But... A couple of days ago. Yes, uh, but also uh, high school uh, athletes, you know, with college athletes, all of these um, students and uh, sports um, personnel and, you know, athletes are at risk. And one of the things we're seeing is, you know, unfortunately, even those patients who are not very symptomatic when they were fighting the COVID infection, some of them had no symptoms at all. Even those are having, um, you know, problems with heart and they're not finding this out until they're on the field uh, with high endurance type activity. That's when they're getting into trouble. That's when they're symptomatic and realizing that they can't do what they were able to do prior to COVID. And um, that's something that is a concern, especially with schools opening up, uh, colleges opening up and sure. you know, uh, professional sports. Um, it is an issue that we think that we're gonna and, deal with a lot more. And your state of Texas, you know, they love their sports, Friday Night Lights, the Cowboys. I mean, the, your, your area is a hotbed for sports. So gotta take- well, we are, especially off. football, yes. Yeah, well, but so that's the interesting part, right? They're all making contact with each other. They gotta tackle, they gotta make a pass, they gotta do whatever. So, and they even have to touch each other's hands, you know, they're feeding the ball to them under the snap. So in these tackles, how do we know it's not being transmitted? Like 
What well, is there a possibility that could happen in a play itself? Absolutely can. Um, and you're right, we don't know that transmissions are not happening. We have to assume that they are happening because uh, okay. especially in the state of Texas right now, our numbers are so high. Um, you know, we're second in the nation in terms of our uh, current numbers and they're growing, you know. Um, so we have to take the proper precautions. We have to uh, screen our uh, athletes. And, you know, the best thing coming from a medical professional, the best thing to sure. do would be to avoid contact sports right now in the middle of a pandemic. That's the best thing. Right. But whether that will be heard by the community or not, uh, I don't know. And how practical it is for them also is uh, something to consider because you know, for these athletes, if you tell them to sit out for a season or two, uh, I don't know how that goes for them. But from a medical standpoint, it is better to avoid contact sports right now. Well, this is interesting because also basketball has been a very contact sport. I actually almost laughed because, you know, these guys are, you know, in basketball, they're rejecting the shot. They're really, you know, body on body trying to defend. But when they go to the bench, they're six feet apart. It's like, but that's not really making sense if they're already making contact on the court. I don't know. It was, it was just kind of a funny sight. Um, I, I know what you mean. Yes. Because mm -hmm. when they're playing, when they're on the field, they're very close. It's contact yeah. sports. It doesn't matter how much space you're maintaining on the bench. <laughs> Yeah, well, right. And all these NFL coaches are getting fined now for not wearing it. It's a mess. Um, I've got a personal thing. So luckily I haven't had this yet, but my, my quote unquote condition, I mean, I rolled it on one leg in New York, which is fun. And I've had pneumonia issues in the past. So I'm trying to stay very hypersensitive with this right now. But Vactoral, I have Vater syndrome, V-A-T-E-R. I know some in that community have the Vactoral, which is including cardio. So if you want to take a minute, if you know of the that condition, Bacteroa Vater, tell us how those in the community can avoid this and, and how important it is for Bacteroa patients um, to not get this right now. Well, um, you know, you are predisposed to having um, lung infections, which is pneumonia. And uh, one of the things we know with COVID is, um, you know, it is affecting the lungs. It's uh, the main reason people are getting into trouble is with breathing. They're having shortness of breath, their blood oxygen level is dropping. The reason the blood oxygen level is dropping is because the infection is going to the lungs and is uh, not allowing the lungs to, uh, you know, Sure. do what it's supposed to do, like, you know, provide uh, oxygenation to the blood properly. And so um, you have to be extra careful. Um, you have to maintain immune health. You have to maintain mm -hmm. all the precautions of, you know, avoiding um, contact um, or, you know, uh, going right. to public places, wearing masks and things like that, because your, uh, you know, your immune system is slightly different and you are more predisposed to having infection in the lungs as it is. Yeah, I mean, I've not had, I've had pneumonia in the past. It's, it's not fun. And so that kind of made me more sense, hypersensitive, I guess, to this thing. Um, but to be honest, when I'm not really around people or if I'm outdoors, I don't wear it on my roll blade because I need that air anyway. So I feel like you can find a balance with this, can't you? The mask versus not wearing a mask situation. It there is, uh, there is a fine balance, and it's very important for us to understand that balance and practice it. Um, for instance, if you're ever in an indoor setting and uh, you know, you're know you in contact with people other than your household, um, then you should absolutely be wearing a mask um, anytime you're in the indoor setting. And you know this virus has been declared airborne in the indoor settings, so that means you have to um, everybody should be universal masking, not just one person. Um, when you're outdoors, um, it's a little different story. When you're outdoors, if you're in a crowded area outdoors, you should still be wearing your mask. But in an outdoor setting, when there's not too many people around you and you have the social distancing maintained. Right. Uh, you can take your mask off uh, when you're going on a hike, you know, like, and there's uh, not too many people around you. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you can take your mask off and breathe the fresh air. In fact, I've done that not too long ago, just a few weeks Good. ago, I was in Seattle. Yeah, I actually went to visit my brother in Seattle. And, uh, you know, I was very nervous because this was the first time I traveled during the pandemic. Um, sure. And uh, I was actually traveling by air. So it was kind of putting myself through a test. Um, so I 
I took every precaution when I went to the, because you know, you have to do your homework. You have to understand where the highest risk of transmission is. The highest risk of transmission was actually in the airport. So I had my N95 mask on. I was wearing a sure. face shield. I, uh, you know, had all my hand sanitization, uh, gloves, everything. I had everything on. Then I went into the, it, the next pl place is the plane itself inside the plane. So I did my homework with the airlines to see which airline was following the guidelines of, you know, um, so I, I took a, I, I paid, paid a higher price for my flight, but I okay. took a flight that was doing that. And then when I went uh, to Seattle, we went outdoors, I went hiking, and it was totally fine, because, uh, you know, we mm -hmm. made sure that there was not too many people around us, and I didn't have my mask on, and it was okay. It was a month ago. That's that's great, and uh, and no symptoms since, obviously, so that's even better. No, no, uh, and I've tested also. I, I mean, I had to, because um, I would be seeing patients, so I came back, um, I quarantined, I um, tested myself, and it was negative. Dr. Farah, were you on the COVID floor or have you been on the COVID floor during all this? And what's that experience like for you? Yes, uh, very much so. I have been um, involved with taking care of COVID patients um, uh, because, you know, uh, a lot of COVID patients are also having heart problems. So mm -hmm. as a cardiologist, uh, I had to be pretty involved with that. It's pretty bad. Um, it's unlike anything I have ever seen in my mm -hmm. uh, career or in my life for that matter. Uh, we went from, you know, a uh, regular hospital floor, which means, you know, you, your patients are mm -hmm. in the room, it's, it's normal to completely getting shut down. Like, you know, we have now warded off uh, the COVID units, especially the ICU. It, it's a different world. It, everybody's in their suits, you know, like it, mm -hmm. it almost feels like you're in space somewhere because you don't, Sure. it's a different world. Um, one of the things that's also very impactful for patients and it's affecting physicians as well um mm. you know from a psychosocial standpoint yeah. Um, yeah is the patients are very isolated you know like we mm. have limited contact with the patients we are nursing staff physicians everybody's only going to the patient's room when needed so just to like you know minimize the spread that has an effect on the patients you know they're very isolated Family members are not allowed to visit. Um, right. And as physicians, it affects us too, because we are very much used to being hands-on, going to our patients, talking to them and providing them that kind of care and not being able to do that and having to maintain that distance. It's difficult as physicians. Well, and this, is my, this leads into my next question, which would be, you are, you've been on there, you, you've seen the social, the, psych, the psychological impact. So how do you, sort of de-stress yourself at the end of the day like how do you get out of that and and stay cheer because you're very upbeat right now so how do you stay upbeat about the day after what you just saw two minutes ago literally yeah. on it's very difficult um it has definitely taken a toll um from a psychological standpoint i think it has on every single healthcare provider one of the ways i have been trying to, um, you know, relieve myself of uh, that kind of level of, um, you know, psychological problems is when I come home, I try to focus on the positives, you know, like I try to see how many patients I was able to help and mm -hmm. uh, that they're going to be hopefully better off tomorrow as a result of what I did. That's one. And that's what I think of as I drive home, you know, as I drive home, it's like a debriefing that goes through my head. And then once I get home, I try to completely remove myself from the healthcare side of things. I try to do things that I enjoy. You know, I like to sing. So I, I actually had stopped singing for some time, but during the sure. pandemic, I picked back up on singing because it's a huge stress relief for me. Um, I started painting again uh, during the pandemic. Uh, those were some of my hobbies. I, I because when I was so busy, I had uh, not had the time to do so for the last, you know, before the pandemic for a while. But I restarted all of those. I started, um, I'm writing a cookbook. So I have a awesome. healthy cookbook. So started becoming more productive, in other words, uh, putting my energy and thoughts to other things to take my mind off. Well, and painting really is like a good, a good strategy, right? To get your mind off that. And I, I find that with writing. Right? So instead of scrolling, I'd rather find that the movement of the hand, even through writing, is just so cathartic right now. It's it just is. Because obviously you and I and everybody else scrolls through our phones and tries to escape that way. But sometimes 
literally getting hands on with, with what the activity you're doing is so much better than scrolling. But it is. And, you know, getting away from that screen time is important too for our health, um, you know, exercising. So I've been doing a lot of that, uh, walking every day to maintain a good health during this pandemic. Now, I see that you said you're in Lubbock, Texas. So I got to ask you this. Are you an AM, A&M fan? Are you, what, what fan are you? And are you a big college football fan down there? Because Lubbock is like- Oh the- boy, that is, a, that is a big question because it's funny because I get that question actually asked a lot. I went to Lubbock, Texas, uh, which is Texas Tech for medical school. Yes, Texas. Uh, but prior to that, I went to University of Texas at Austin, which is UT Austin for undergrad. And they're actually one of the biggest football teams here in Texas. You probably have heard of them. Um, and for my cardiology training for fellowship, I went to OU, University of Oklahoma. They're a big team. Not a big college school at all, you know, I mean. <laughs> and before uh, that, I did my internal medicine training at Texas A&M. So those are the big four. So all those are the most competitive teams in Texas. And I actually went to all four of them. So what I like to say is that I can never lose a football game. <laughs> So wait, do you have like a shirt or something from every team at this point? Is that what that's about? I do actually, believe it or not. But you know, my alma mater is UT Austin. So um, that's that's what I go back to, UT Austin. But yeah, I having been a part of every single one of these um, big schools, I, I can't really feel bad about one of them losing versus the other. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm a Notre Dame fan. Like that's my main thing. I happen to like Michigan because of... Uh, I love Jim Harbaugh's coaching style. He's very intense. But Notre Dame, you know, has all these positive cases. Again, that's another thing where it's amazing that didn't happen in game. It happened in practice. Like, imagine that happens in game. It didn't happen for them, so thank God for that. But uh, when Notre Dame did get it, it was just kind of like a, a, a wake-up call, wouldn't you say? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, it, it should be a wake-up call and um, for everybody. Uh for yeah. all teams that are contact sports uh, at all levels, you know, not just professional sports or college sports, but uh, high school sports included. All right. So last night, because, you know, I think college kids have sort of the same mentality of we're not afraid of this, we're, which is exactly what President Trump said yesterday. He said, do not be afraid. I get where he's coming from for that. I agree that we have to live our life, but he didn't mention living it with precaution. That was the only thing about that. Um, he didn't say, you know, live your life but be cautious. He only said, don't be afraid of this and you're going to feed it. And that just seemed out to lunch. But wouldn't that message have been more effective if he said, yes, live your life. Do not be afraid of this, but please be cautious. I think that would have worked better. I completely agree with you. Um, in the medical community, we we do believe that the message would, would have been uh, more effective if he stated it, stated it the way you're suggesting. Um, you know, people obviously have to live their lives. People have to be able to go to work. Um, those, you know, essential things have to be done, no question about it. So he's right that you have to live your lives. Uh, but at the same time, the message should have been uh, more firm on the fact that we are nowhere close to beating this pandemic yet. Uh, we do not have a vaccine out yet. Uh, so it is very important for us to continue to take the precautions that we've been taking, which is uh, you know wearing masks, maintaining sh- social distancing, washing hands, all of those. So yes, the message could have definitely been um, better. Now you, I know you've done a lot of different rounds on TV with ABC with other, with all these news outlets. So let's talk about that because as a doctor, are you also frustrated with the way the mainstream media has handled this? Could they have done it? What could they have done differently from a medical perspective that you're that they're not? Well. Um, you know, from a medical standpoint, I feel that a lot of times um, mainstream media, they focus on, you know, what's not happening uh, or how, who said what. Uh, and the main message sometimes gets lost uh, in that. Um, so I think one thing that could have been done better possibly is by bringing in more physicians and putting them in the forefront of media. Mm-hmm. Physicians who are, you know, trained and, um, you know, who are dealing with COVID patients, talking about their experience, giving real life examples and making it more uh, visible to patients. Because, you know, from a patient standpoint or population standpoint, they're not seeing what we're seeing in the the ICU. And it's sometimes hard to gauge when you just see it in the news, like, or read about it. But to hear 
you know, like illustrations of real life examples would have made an impact in this pandemic, I believe. So that's something we could have done differently. Uh, and the sure. mainstream media had the opportunity to do that by bringing in doctors from all walks of life, from different parts, not just one doctor or one part of the country, but different right. uh, places to let them have a voice so that they can have a direct communication with the population here in the United States. Well, and I do, you know, I know you might not want to criticize him and there's really nothing to criticize except the fact that he, Dr. Fauci's messaging was all over the place. Like February said this and he said, but overall, you know, we've always been told to get a second opinion. I just felt that wasn't the case here. They listened to one guy, one doctor only. And I was like, as you say, there are tons of others that probably could have said something too. Yes. Um, I, I think, you know, you know, to, uh, the pandemic, you know, and COVID-19 was such a new thing. Really, no one knew what they were talking about initially, uh, including World Health Organization, CDC. Uh, guidelines changed as they got more information um, because simply it, we didn't have enough information. But as right. the pandemic grew, as we, uh, you know, it progressed and as we got more information, not just from here in the U.S., but from other parts of the world who experienced it before we did, um, we should have been more forthcoming about talking about it and uh, informing mm -hmm. the public appropriately uh, in a timely manner. And, um, you know, I absolutely think it would have made a difference if we had brought in individual physicians uh, from different parts of the country who are dealing with mass numbers of um, COVID-19, especially the ICU setting, what they were seeing. Oh. If people heard some of the stories from these physicians, I, I, I bet you it would have made a difference. In, um, well, right. And it seems like the Seattle nursing home was kind of like, all right, well, that's our first death, but they didn't really talk to anybody at the nursing home, did they? Like they didn't interview anybody that was treating only the times of this article of how they were doing their testing. That's how they found out because CDC said, don't do it. They ended up doing it, which was pretty, the word cavalier has been thrown around so much during this time, but apparently that was cavalier to do testing when the CDC shouldn't, but thank God they did, right? Or the nursing home thing wouldn't have been popping up at all. Right, right. Um, Nursing home has been, nurse, nursing homes across the entire nation, they've been the mm -hmm. hardest hit places for COVID. Uh, we've lost many, many, many uh, nursing home residents to COVID. So there are a lot of discussions actually among uh, big institutions uh, as to how that can be improved in the future to prevent uh, you know, outbreaks like these from happening, like what precautions they can take from an infectious disease standpoint uh, to improve those conditions. Dr. Farah, I would also love you back to talk about healthy foods during this pandemic and after when we see the other side of this. So come back for that. I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that because I know you're writing a book and, and all the recipes. So come back and talk to us about that. But one last thing, um, one thing, you know, they talk about the heart, the lungs, but really the kidney and the liver have also been at risk with this, right? So do you have any advice on that? If you have a kidney, I only yes. have one. That's why I'm asking. Yes, um, you're right. So COVID-19 uh, infection for people who are getting sick with it, um, what it's causing is an overwhelming inflammatory response in the body, uh, which is of course affecting the lungs and the heart. Uh, but one of the other things that's affecting is the kidneys. People are uh, seem to have acute kidney injury, meaning kidneys are just like not able to keep up with that level of inflammation. Uh, and some of them are actually going into kidney failure. Um, same thing with liver. Uh, liver is more part of a multi-organ failure system when you are having you know, your pulmonary system fail, uh, heart fail, kidneys fail, liver uh, is you know, no different. It's a major organ, it also suffers. Uh, one of the ways to prevent that would be uh, you know, by eating healthier food absolutely matters. You know, your sodium mm -hmm. intake, basically risk factors, uh, minimizing risk factors, like make sure your high blood pressure is under check, under control, take your mm. medications as prescribed, make sure your diabetes is under control, make sure your cholesterol level is under control, uh, you yep. know, smoking cessation, this is a good time to think about that for those who are still smoking. Um, sodium is a really big deal when it comes to the kidney. You, uh, you need to watch how much salt you're taking, what kind of food you're taking. So, you know, just briefly, I'll say healthy food means uh, more vegetables, less salt, less fatty cholesterol food. Yeah, I've kind of gone to Splenda for my iced coffee, but it's just, 
No, actually, and, and the other thing is, is, as we're talking about this, it reminds me that we basically have this structure of symptoms. If you have this, that, and the other, but internally, we have to look out for the symptoms internally, right? Not just whether we're coughing or not, but there's so many more things that, that we need to be aware of. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, it's not just externally, internally, like, you know, um, uh, some people are having different symptoms, like, you know, from what majority are having. A lot of patients have told me, and we're, we're seeing it, is one of the signs is hair loss. A lot of people are actually having serious hair loss as a result of uh, COVID, which, you know, we haven't seen any, uh, you know, medical literature on this. So I can't really comment on that with data. There's no real evidence uh, proof, yet. Right. Uh, but, uh, but I am hearing of people just like from patient to patient, they're um, complaining of that. That's been brought up several times in my experience. That's, that's fascinating. Um, and hopefully, I, I, I don't know, it, it, it seemed like there was a whole bunch of different things that no one would like it through the eyes and all that. Like, it almost sounds sci-fi, but I guess there has been proven cases of all of this stuff. Well, Dr. Farah, thanks so much for joining me tonight. And uh, I usually ask this of everybody, what's one thing that your patients or your friends, or your family, or one thing that nobody knows about you that you're, you're feeling comfortable talking about? Like one thing. That no one knows about. <laughs> well, that's that's the hardest question yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I kind of already gave it away, didn't I? I sing and I paint. Uh, most people don't know about that. Um, and um, what else? I guess I'm kind of a reserved person. It doesn't seem like it because I'm doing all these interviews, but uh, sure. internally, I'm actually a shy person. Most people don't know that about me. <laughs> Well, I feel like you're the one that uh, type that, you know, just puts their head down and, and gets through the work and then the other stuff will happen, you know, come later, you know, so you just gotta get through the work. And Yeah, well, I guess I, I can say one other that nobody, I guess, knows about it just yet. I am very big on environmental um, issues. So I, um, I promote, you know, a healthy environment um, uh, because it has an impact on heart. So um, I am part of uh, Global Health Alliance Foundation. I'm actually one of the founding directors. And one of the, um, you know, we, we address several key issues uh, at a global level. And one of the issues that we're working on right now is climate change and environment. Uh, so, you know, I've been talking primarily about health related issues. Uh, so I guess people haven't quite gotten to know about the environment side of things with me yet, so. It's interesting you talk about you know global warming and you're in Texas. Not many in Texas seem to talk about it that way, but uh, who knows if there are more out there who are who are talking um, about climate change and all this other stuff. Maybe Texas does go blue at the end of the day. Who knows, right? We have to. We have to see. <laughs> That's the hope. One of these days, right? <laughs> hey, uh, Dr. Farah, thank you so much, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you for inviting me on your show. It was a pleasure.